This presentation is made available for educational purposes only to provide you general information and a general understanding of the law. It is not intended to provide nor does it constitute legal or tax advice. The presentation should not be used as a substitute for specific legal or tax advice from a licensed professional attorney or tax consultant that you have engaged for that purpose. Further, the subject matter contained in this presentation is complex and subject to change. Any tax statements in this program are not intended to suggest the avoidance of U.S. federal, state, or local tax penalties. What are the 2013 action items that employers need to be aware of to be compliant under the Health Care Reform Act? The uh, first and uh, primary changes that went into effect as of January 1st, 2013 are the changes to the amount that employees can contribute to a health flexible spending account. It used to be that those amounts would be limited by plan terms only, uh, but now they're limited to $2,500. Um, per year and you just want to make sure that if you have plans in place that provide for this benefit that you do limit it to 2500 over the calendar year or any plan year that begins after January 1st, 2013. Um, this will require a plan amendment if it's over $2,500 currently. Um, even if you are complying in operation, you still have to amend the plan and that needs to be done by the end of 2013. Uh, W-2 reporting. Okay, if you've already sent out your W-2s, you might just want to make sure that everything on health care costs were reported. If you had W-2s in excess of 250, if you issued over 250 uh, W-2s for last year, then you have to make sure that you uh, report health care costs um, on the employee's W-2. And these health care costs include both employee and the employer portion. So it's actually your COBRA cost minus any 2% administrative charge. Um, so that's important to make sure that that was done. Um, if you are a smaller group, you could <coughs> comply with that rule, but you're not required to. And there's this transition rule for that more than 250 um, is in place until we get additional guidance. So everyone stay tuned. Um, that additional guidance is coming out at a rate of about a thousand pages a week. That was last week, but um, anyway. Um, also on March 1st of 2013, Employers, and there is no limit on how many employees you have to have, but employers are required to provide exchange notices. These are notices to employees informing them of the exchanges that will be available in 2014, as well as you know subsidy potential and things like that. The most interesting and notable issue about the exchange notice is that we do not have a model. We're not really sure what it's supposed to say yet. Um, I have been advising clients that we're hopeful that we'll get a model notice by March, by February 28th, um, or you know we'll end up having to draft one unless they extend the deadline. Um, as of right now, again, they have not yet issued from HHS or DOL a model notice, um, and it's we're not sure exactly how detailed these notices are supposed to be, especially since none of the exchanges have actually started yet. So that being said. Um, those are a couple of the big things for 2013. One thing I like to point out is, although not yet um, implemented, um, is the non the new non discrimination rules with respect to non grandfathered health plans. If you have a health plan that is not grandfathered, <coughs> there are new rules that were supposed to go into effect in 2011, but everyone thought they were way too complicated, and the Department of Labor said no one can apply them yet. Um, but the new rules basically say that you cannot discriminate against your higher paid employees. So a lot of people may have management carve outs in which the management employees have health insurance or the management pays a, a smaller amount for coverage than say staff or um, other individuals in the, in the organization. If that's happening, those plans may be considered to be discriminatory. And you may say, ah, eh, well, you know, that's okay, except for the fact that the penalty is $100 per day per person discriminated against. So it's not based on who you're providing the better benefits to, like your two management employees, which might be palatable. It's actually all those who are not getting the better benefits, so that um, 
penalty can rise pretty significantly and pretty quickly. One of the things that I've been advising clients and employers to at least consider is if you currently have a management carve out, how are you going to take steps to design your plan to meet these discrimination requirements if it were going to come to pass? And one of the ways to do that is to talk to your insurance broker, talk to your consultant, see what steps can be taken. Um, so those are kind of my thoughts on 2013 and I'm... If I can start off by, by adding to that, because uh, sure. one of the things that we run into with our, our clients a lot is that um, the, what, what she was referring to with the 105H testing, the discrimination testing, uh, if you've been self-funded, you're pretty much familiar with those rules, but for the longest time, uh, fully insured plans weren't subject to that. And so a uh, small mom and pop uh, business, uh, of course the family pays less, but the, the, the workers pay a little bit more. It never hit their radar, um, but that is something that, that, we, that we need to plan for this year because once the, once the enforcement kicks in, it's gonna be for all businesses. And, and there's two approaches to this. It's not just for the access, uh, which Kirsten was mentioning, it is also for the contribution. And so people are focusing on, well, I don't have a, a management carve out or I do offer it to all my employees, so it doesn't affect me. But the fact that you're paying 100% for your family or your management team, but you're only paying 60% or 70% for the rest of your workforce, that can become a real issue. Um, and, and there needs to be some thought process as to how you're gonna remedy that. Because um, once they start enforcing this, we believe within six months, you're gonna have to, to get with it and, and the, uh, the penalties are quite steep. And uh, it, just to follow up, they're one of the reasons they, they're not enforcing it until they issue regulation. And so once they issue regulations, they have indicated that it'll be prospective. We just don't know how far it will be prospective. And we don't know whether there's going to be simplifications, whether there will be any exceptions, but it is important to kind of keep it in the back of your mind if there's already that type of an arrangement in place. What are the rollout of taxes and fees employers will see in 2013? Basically, there are, um, there's an increase in the employee portion of FICA. It's an increase of 0.9%, and it is based on um, adjusted gross income. However, as we all know from employers, nobody's going to go into somebody and say, hey, I need to have your adjusted gross income, so your spouse makes what? Um, nobody's going to want to release that information. So they have issued some rules, and basically it says that adjusted gross income over 250000 for uh, married and filing jointly, 125,000 for single and or and 200,000 for married and filing separately. I believe I have all those right, but um, <laughs> the issue is is that because employers are not going to have adjusted gross income, the requirement for employers is to withhold this additional 0.9% um, on wages that you pay to an employee that are over 200,000. So if you have so anybody who makes over 200,000 you're going to go ahead and withhold this additional amount the interesting fact that can happen with that is for example if you have two people who make 150,000 then nothing's going to be withheld for them yet they're going to make 300,000 and they'll have an adjusted they'll have an increase in their taxes that they will have to report on their personal income tax when they file um, the opposite can also happen if for example you have someone who makes 230,000 but files jointly you've withheld funds from them but when they go to file their adjusted gross income will be less than that and there will be no reason for them to have had those monies withheld and they'll be getting in a, um, a uh, rebate uh, from the government a refund based on those amounts so that's important to, to note there is also an increase in um, and this is not an employer tax it is a personal tax but when employees might bring it up and that is um, deductions. Your deductions usually on your income tax were at 7.5% of any, if your medical expenses exceeded 7.5% of your AGI, you were allowed to take a deduction for any amounts over that. That amount has increased from 7.5% to 10%. Um, so it's just something to note if anybody's been taking that personal deduction. Um, there is also an increased um, Medicare contribution tax of 3.8% on unearned income. Um, that is just something that has to be considered, again, not an employer tax, but is, a, um, but is something that will need to be considered on individual taxes if anyone has any questions. As you can probably point out, this is 20, 2013 has really been the year of revenue raisers. 
um, both by the increases in taxes on the Medicare side to help fund some of these programs that have gone into place. It's also the reduction in, for example, the flexible spending account, which doesn't seem like a big deal, but that's also a revenue raiser because it reduces the amount of money that is on a pre-tax basis. Um, I don't know if anybody has any better information on the 3.8% the that they'd like to jump in on the, the individual tax on the unearned income. I just kind of touched on it very briefly, but it's basically, you know, your tax dividends and things like that. It does apply to self in, self, um, self-employed individuals as well. So it's just something to point out, discuss with accountants if it becomes an issue for you. Um, a tax that I wanted to make sure I, I, I hit on, and, and you're exactly right, that this is the year that revenue is, is being rolled out. Um, as a disclaimer, kind of, we're not the absolute experts on this. This this information is constantly changing. If nothing else, this should be a wake up that, that there is a lot of information that people need to be aware of, whether you're for, against, or indifferent to um, healthcare reform, it's the law of the land. And for a lot of time, uh, a lot of people were just kind of waiting to see what would happen or hoping it didn't happen or you know those type of things. It's here and it's not going away. So people are now digging into these kind of details. One of which I was thinking about that might be important to some of your members is the medical device tax. If you're a manufacturer of, medi of um, medical devices, uh, it's an additional 2.3% tax um, with sales starting uh, January 1st of 2013. Um, so I, I know that you have a diverse group, uh, but that, that's, I'm sure that's hitting somebody. Uh, <laughs> And that's, uh, that's one of those uh, taxes that, that um, people weren't really right. prepared them for until the bills started going into place. What, on that, where is that tax? Is that just when the device goes to the hospital? Is it every step of the manufacturing chain or? I can follow up on exactly where it ends up, but I believe it's based on the actual sale to an individual or to a hospital by a producer. So it's at the end. By a producer or an importer, yes. It's not when it's actually made or manufactured, but it's the sale of that item that actually yeah, raises the A lot the of cost. folks here are supply chain, and, yep. and sometimes there's a lot of steps along the way before it gets to the end. And I know that there is a ton of information on there, and I know that the accountants are up to speed on a lot of that information as well. The other important thing um, on that is, is that the reporting is done on a quarterly basis and the first quarterly reports are due, I believe, April, in, um, in April. So uh, kind of try to keep that also in the back of your mind as well. Um, there's one other fee that comes into point. Um, one fee that I thought about was there is a, a tax, a 1% tax on self-funded plans. And um, that tax will go up every year. I think it starts at 1% goes up to two, uh, you know, and it all, grandfather's up to, I think, six or seven percent. Mm -hmm. um, those need to be understood as well because, again, if you have a rate pass, potentially in a given year, you will have basically an increase, in essence, mm -hmm. because of that tax uh, on those self-funded plans. Now, those are the bigger carrier, bigger companies, obviously, but I don't know if that was the tax you were going to reference. Um, actually, I was going to talk about the, compar the comparative effectiveness fees as well. There's another fee. Obvious, if you have an insured plan, you really don't need to worry about it because the insurers are going to pay um, for the comparative effectiveness fee. It's charged actually to the insurer and it's a $1 or $2 per participant depending on the year. Um, and it goes on, I believe, through 2019, and it's supposed <coughs> to fund an organization which name escapes me right now, but the organization is supposed to be able to provide quality and um, controls. Patient outcome research Patient-centered outcome research or something like that. Can't imagine why I couldn't remember. <laughs> <laughs> um, but the um, but the concept of this is to actually uh, uh, provide more quality controls in the arena. Um, how it all is going to fit in, we'll see. But this um, fee is supposed to fund that portion. If I can tag on to that, um, your your point well taken about that that uh, in a fully insured forum, you're not really looking at it as, okay, this is something I have to remember to pay. Patrick's point on the self-funded is mm -hmm. you are, you know, it, it falls, the impetus falls on you. But just uh, the the carriers are not gonna eat that money. Um, so that, that, that it does hit you because it's gonna be passed through. Those $2, um, you know, it's basically winding up being about $2 per member fee. Uh, yes, it's paid by the carrier, it's on the carrier, but amongst the other charges that we're gonna see, ultimately it's gonna get transferred down to you and to your employees. Uh, we're thinking that the cumulative, and, and, I, and this number has been bounced around a lot, but when you start looking at the patient-centered outcome fee, the uh, transitional uh, resource, uh, reinsurance program uh, premiums, health insurance tax, 
uh, the, the difference on your fully insured rate in 2014 might be 3.84%, just because of those things that you're not being, having to pay, the carrier has to pay. Well, yes, you have to pay ultimately because it's gonna get passed through to you. So th that bar keeps growing and, that, and, and as uh, different reports come out about how potentially unfunded some of these areas uh, or some of the parts of the, uh, that the exchanges might be, those areas may continue to grow uh, and the impact could be higher and higher, um, but it will be passed ultimately on to you and, and to, the, to your employees. What is the 2014 pay or play decision in the new IRS guidance in the regulations? It appears 2014 makes it even worse. It can make it worse and it can make it better. It all depends on your perspective and where you are and, and what types of benefits you provide and where your employees are and your demographics. I mean, it, it, goes, it, goes, it runs the gambit. Um, the rules are in 2014, I mean, this, this is the critical year. Um, I mean, healthcare reform is, is, extends from 2010 until 2019. So it spans a wide arena, but 2014 is the critical year. It's the one everyone's argued about. It's the one you've discussed at cocktail parties. Um, and I use discuss lightly, it could all very well be a very big argument, but um, the idea is, is that in 2014, the employer mandate and the individual mandate go into play. The in employer mandate is that if you have more than 50 full-time employees or full-time equivalents, you do not have to provide coverage, but if you fail to provide coverage or you provide coverage that is not considered affordable or does not meet certain values, uh, value levels, then you will have, then you may be subject to a penalty. Now, the way the penalties are calculated, and I'm just going to go through this briefly because there's there's a whole lot of complexity that goes into this, but I think for today it suffices to say that if you do not provide coverage, the penalty is $2,000. The penalty applies if you have an employee that goes to the exchanges because you don't have coverage, they go to the exchange, they get coverage, and they are eligible for a subsidy. If one employee does that, you will have a penalty that is equal to $2,000 times all of your full-time employees. Do not have to include full-time equivalents or part-times, it's just full-time employees minus the first 30. So you get 30 for free. <laughs> um, so, but, so you know, if you have 30 full-time employees, then you're golden, and all the rest are full-time equivalents, then you won't have any penalties. If you have less than 50 full-time equivalents, you will not have penalties. Um, if you offer coverage that is unaffordable or does not meet the minimum values, and you have an employee that goes to the exchange and gets coverage and is eligible for a subsidy, then you will have a penalty equal to $3,000 times the number of people that go to the exchange. Um, and if that happened, but it can't be more than the $2,000 penalty if that were applied. So there are some caps, but it all depends on your demographics. The financial analysis on whether or not to pay or play is, although it sounds complicated, can be done and can be determined as to what your potential risk may be once you have an idea of who's eligible for a subsidy. Um, basically, subsidies apply to those who make four times the federal poverty level, which in 2012 for a family of four was 92.9. Um, so, you know, that's how you would kind of look to see who is the base of, who, of, of your people that could get you subject to um, a penalty. Um, and that's where the basis and, and, the, and the determination starts. Can I jump in sure, on that? Sure, of course. Uh, sometimes when we throw out that number, it, it, it gets lost. But if we can break it down to, to what you probably run into with your employees, um, that, that poverty level of 400%, if you break that down based on, um, there's a safe harbor that says you're looking at, it can't exceed 9.5% of their either hourly income or, or their W-2. What does that mean? Well, that means that if you had someone that makes uh, $8.05 an hour, you know, so they make uh, a little bit less than $17,000 a year, 9.5% if they're working 40 hours a, a month, they can't, their portion of the premium can't exceed $132 a month. So all of a sudden that gets a lot more real when we start talking about, well, I pay for benefits for my employees and we pay a good chunk of it. You know, we probably won't have anybody that, that, that qualifies for subsidy. Well, all of a sudden you realize it doesn't take much. Um, and, it, and as a caveat to that, if, if Florida 
because, and we're gonna get into later what, where Florida stands on some of this stuff, but if, if we wind up not being one of the states that expands Medicaid, uh, um, which was gonna be picking up some of the, the lower income folks, all of a sudden now you're looking at the line at 101%, which if a person's working minimum wage, so it was at $7 and a quarter, and they're only working 30 hours, because that's all it takes to, to trigger this, you're talking about someone that can't spend more than $90 a month on their portion of health insurance without triggering their ab ability to get a subsidy. So, and the reason why I point that out is because I've, I've had clients that say, oh, well, we pay, you know, we pay 80% already, we're, we're golden, we're gonna be good. And then when you start looking at, well, did you think about the guy in the warehouse? Did you think about how much he's paying and percentage of his income? It's well over that nine and a half percent. You have someone, and it only takes that one to trigger it, which could get you into this penalty phase. phase. And, and, and highly recommend, and, and um, I'm sure Patrick um, can explain on this as well, that, um, that, that if, you, if you're a group that has more than 50 employees or potentially more than 50 employees, or you have a lot of part-time employees, that at some point this year, you should, you should go through a pay or play exercise, a, a calculator. Um, you know, lots of consulting firms uh, have these in place to say, okay, you have a lot of part-time people, you have a lot of seasonal people, let's start figuring out where am I in this matrix? What do I, what's my poten potential penalty? Because that once you get that base, then you can look at some of the other factors to determine whether or not it makes sense to pay or play. On that $130 a month in your example, is that for the individual employee coverage or the family plan or it, that's that we the, offer all these different options that it's the employee portion of the employee plan of the lowest available plan so if you open it off so multiple just the plans, employee you don't have to cover their entire family for that you have to offer coverage that is, is, is available to dependents and, uh, and that's been, exactly uh, and not spouses. Enough, you know the spouses are pretty much left out <coughs> the cold the new regulations that just came out last week indicated that when you offer this coverage, the coverage has to be available to dependents, but they define dependents as children under the age of 26. You do not have to expand it beyond there, so therefore you don't have to go to your spouse. Your spouse is left out in the cold. But part of the good thing about that is it does allow the spouse then to have the option of going to the exchange, um, which if, if, if not working and things like that. So there is actually a hidden benefit to that. Um, and I just want to mention to you on this affordability issue, um, depend, determining whether or not your plans are affordable, which is all part of the pay or play, because that depends on whether or not people can go to the exchanges as well. Um, you know, you have your subsidy determination, your determination as to whether or not your plan's affordable. And, um, you know, one option that some companies have looked at has been reverse discrimination. You know, charging those people at, um, you know, making lower amounts, a lower amount for insurance so that they reverse the issue which actually addresses a whole host of issues it takes care of certain discrimination issues it also takes care of meeting this affordability if that's the decision that you make um, one other issue is is that there's now three safe harbors for purposes of defer de determining affordability um, the new regulation said you can look at nine and a half percent of the federal poverty level so if you have people that may be making a variety of wages you can look at the federal poverty level and not charge more less than I'm sorry not charge an employee for employee only coverage nine and a half percent of the federal poverty level you can look at their w-2 wages I'll figure that one out before the is call. there a test for the affordability for that dependent coverage that not yet um, and okay. right now it's been silent on that so we don't know what that level so is. no so the loophole there and I hate this loophole but I'm a lot of people do it and I'm we're just as guilty so the loophole is is that if you have um, you could charge your employee only rate nine and a half percent and then require everyone for dependents to pay for hundred percent so you know that begs the question, and there have been discussions, and there's a lot of commentary out there right now <coughs> on whether or not that really makes it affordable. Because the issue is you can only go to the exchange if you don't have access to affordable employer-provided coverage or other coverage. So the exchange is kind of a last resort. But if you have an employer that provides coverage, and it's affordable for employee only, but not for the dependents, well, then the dependents aren't eligible arguably right now for the exchange the spouses but I'm not sure and this is one thing I'm not clear on is whether or not the spouse because they would be eligible could go and get family coverage and cover the dependents but that being said there is no affordability 
test right now for dependents. And okay. another, another thing on this, are the employees actually required to be insured? Right now, for example, we offer a plan, we pay over 80% for the employee mm -hmm. and like over 70% for the families. Um, only a little more than half of our employees take advantage of that. Now, some of them, the spouse is on a different right. plan where they work and they pick up <coughs> the family covered. plan. Some of them, the employee gets insurance for themselves, not for their kids. And some of them don't take any insurance. Are, the, how's this, are they forced to now or? <laughs> All of this goes into play with the individual mandate. So the individual mandate basically says, is beginning 2014, the general proposition is everyone's got to have coverage. And then you go to the exceptions. And there's a whole list of exceptions of people who don't have to have it. Um, you know, yours, there's your obvious, you know, if you're incarcerated, you don't have to have coverage. Um, if it's unaffordable, you don't have to have coverage. But uh, based on a lot of the terms on the unaffordability, I don't know how big that loophole is going to be because the exchanges will be available as will the subsidies. So there's got to be something more to it than that. Um, I actually have this. But as an, employer, but we, as an employer, we're going to offer it. Are not, do we have not to police required? it? No, you no, do not. Okay. Yeah. There well, is no requirement as an employer to have to that the employees take the employer coverage. The individual mandate is on that employee. As long as you are offering it, then you are okay. <laughs> you don't technically police it, but you're going to be part of the process in providing the information so that HHS and the DOI and all these so are to report who took it and who didn't. Yeah, and, and some of those things have not even been finished yet. Well, how they figure it out at the end of the year because you're going to have to have it provide a statement <laughs> that's going to say, well, this person had coverage, this person didn't, and then they, because they are subject to the penalty if they didn't. But that's again, it, they're, they're, to say you're not part of it isn't isn't necessarily true. It's what part of it? You, you don't have to go and make them, but you're going to be part of on a monthly basis and then annually saying our, our plan was affordable. We offered it. Um, we met the minimum standards. Um, here's the proof that, that uh, Jim had coverage available to him or he didn't. And, and then, then it's on someone else's that regulated. Uh, the so we get plenty of paperwork to do. You do have a ton of paperwork. <laughs> and actually, I laugh when I read the paperwork requirements because not only do you have to report it, but then when you do report it, you have to tell the person that you reported it. It's like, can't we just put this in the notice that we're going to report it? Um, but you have to notify them and let them know that you've turned their name into the government, um, which always makes people feel comfortable. <laughs> so, yes, I mean, there is, you're still, you're definitely part of the process, but requiring people, there's no need to amend your plans to require people to take coverage from the employer. They are still going to be individually um, responsible for the individual mandate and meeting those requirements and not paying the penalty. One of the things that was mentioned was we didn't make this affordable for families, just employees. And that is true with the law. I think that there is going to be a fix to this, especially in the state of Florida, because in the state of Florida, if a family, if a child, if you try and purchase an individual policy for a child, you cannot buy it. it all the insurance carriers have pulled out of that individual market. So if this fix is not corrected and they cannot go to the exchange, there is no private insurance available to children under the age of 19. So. That is a, a problem that we face today, but we think it will be fixed, but who knows when? And uh, again, I think it's important. Another thing that I mentioned, uh, want to mention is there's this list of essential benefits, and we talked about it, that every plan has to meet this list of essential benefits. And um, if you're, you can be penalized if it doesn't, correct? And it can be penalized if it's not affordable. And again, that 9.5%, I think is very important. A rule that we use is you can typically think of $5,000 will typically pay the price for insurance for a year on an individual. And that's very average. Um, that could be higher, that could be lower. You can use that as a kind of an acid test on a, on a rough scale to see what makes sense to you, penalty, pay, or play to stay in the game with the insurance plans. Can I? Well, yeah. oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Just just because it's along the same thought is uh, one thing I, I do want to throw out there is that uh, you know the pay or play um, hits for 50 and above full time equivalents. 
So if you have less than 50, if, if you're a 20 person shop and you've always been, you know, you're not going to exceed the 50, that you still have decisions to make, but you're not subject to the penalty phase. Um, it, that's the that's the one thing. Now the question is whether or not people are under these the 50 are going to just drop. And there's been a a, a wide gamut of, of answers on that. There was uh, the the public push that said, oh, very few will do that. And then there was the on, on kind of our side of the ball, people started saying, well, tons of people are going to do it. But there's so many things that go into that. Even if you don't have the pay or play penalty. Uh, attraction of, of uh, employees. Um, uh, there, there's a there's a whole bunch that goes into you know what's going to make it. Uh, you're in an industry where sometimes 50 cents in, in wages in manufacturing can can draw somebody from one plant to another. Um, you know, not having your health care could wind up being you know because people have a preordained thought about what government run um, insurance might be it might be a differentiator between one one company and another so so i think it's not going to be as big of a blanket of i have less than 50 so i'm dropping and going in or um, i have more and i'll just pay the penalty right and the other side of that coin too is is that if you have less than 50 employees or full-time equivalents you can join the exchange as a company and offer that coverage as a company benefit um, as opposed to having your individual employees go to the exchange um, the exchanges may open to larger employees as time goes by, but the original number, you know, is 50 and under can join the exchange. It does offer an, a, 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 an additional benefit. And it's important to note that the exchanges are not, are still private insurers. I mean, the exchanges are groups of insurers that have been pulled together. They're not the government. They aren't, you know, they are private insurers that are, are pulling together to, to put actuarial values on plan options to be made available. So I think that's kind of an important concept because a lot of times people look at me and say, well, you know, I don't want the government running it. Well, it's still gonna be run generally by the insurance companies. It's not going to be run by the government except for the fact that they're, they're gonna be kind of the gatekeeper, if that makes sense. So if an employer goes to an exchange, mm -hmm. was it the exchange is gonna offer a group plan it will be offered on a group basis. It's my understanding, and they're still working a lot of these exchanges. We don't have all the facts on the exchanges. We know they have to be open to groups of 50 or less. I'm not sure of exactly how those steps If you get a plan up. from an exchange, is it administered by one company out of that? Okay. It so should it's, still be administered kind of by a, one, yes. And there's a gonna broker. be multiple companies in, in the it's exchanges. Exchange. There, there's, you, know, you have the, the public exchange, and you have the private exchange. There's gonna be some, there, there's some, um, brokerage firms, there's some carriers, there's some other places that are setting up their own private exchanges to compete with the public exchange. The difference being that the, the subsidies wouldn't be available in, in, that, in those forms, but because of the control of the population, you may wind up where the rates might there be, um, might be better. Because uh, one of the big myths that, that and there's so much misinformation out there, and that's why we threw out that caveat is, hey, <laughs> nobody's an expert completely in this because it changes completely. But one of the myths I heard so often was, well, at least when the exchanges get here, the rates are going to be are going to go way down. You know, I mean, because it's going to be this is what it's going to happen, and people are going to jump into it because it's going to be so much cheaper because my rates keep going up double digits every year. Yeah. Well, the, if, there, nowhere in the law does it say it's going to be less. Uh, matter of fact, if you read it, it, st it starts with market equivalent rates is where the bar is starting at. So I think that's a myth that's out there. So I think when people say, well, you know, my group's going to be okay, you know, I'll, I'll put them in there. A lot of them are going to get subsidies and, and, and they'll be just fine because it's going to cost so much less than what I'm paying. In, and so it won't really hurt my employees. That's one of the things that when we start getting actual numbers and we start looking at this, that, that you're going to have to factor in. And if, and if you'll bear with me for, for one second, I have an example that I'd like to, to, to use just real real quick because some of the, and, and, and Patrick and I will talk about this before, sometimes people just automatically assume if I have less than 50 or if I have more than, just lower than 50, they'll, they'll be fine in the exchange because they're going to get subsidies. Well, an example I've used going through the pay for play with some of my clients is what happens with your executive now or what happens with your manager now? Um, Yes, a, an employee who has makes thirty six thousand dollars a year, thirty three year old, family of four, he's going to qualify for a big chunk of this of the subsidy because you can't exceed nine and a half percent. You know, he's going to get a big uh, chunk of the subsidy, so he may only spend fifteen hundred dollars a year for a for a plan whose value is thirteen thousand dollars. That's a great deal for him. That's a great deal. 
Here's the converse though, is that when you dump all your employees in there, you didn't just dump him. You also dumped your manager who makes, he's age 57, family four makes 57, uh, excuse me, makes $95,000 a year. He qualifies for none of the subsidy. So now his, because of the, the smaller tiers and all, his value of his plan is $25,000 a year and he gets nothing. And now he not only gets nothing there, but you used to pay 80% of his premium. All of a sudden now, I'm subject to paying for $25,000 for this coverage and my employer's not gonna pay anymore. I don't get any subsidy. All of a sudden that guy's left in the cold and we, we're so focused on, wow, so many people are gonna get the subsidy. Nobody's gonna get hurt. I'm gonna save on my bottom line. Well, do you think that that guy might start looking at other employers who offer coverage? And, and, and that may be where it definitely hits in your realm. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, that's precisely what I've been thinking as I'm listening to all the complexity here forthcoming in 2013, 2014, and yes, while we have our corporate offices that design and develop our plans, I think the big question for us is going to be how do we attract and retain the talent we need with all of these options and you know everything, these decision-making uh, decision uh, issues that come up for our employers, employees, excuse me, so we're gonna to have to do well in attracting the right skill set and retaining them while meeting all of these all of these requirements as well. So it will be Well, I think complex. that's why you have to take into account not just the financial impact to the employer, mm -hmm. but there's also going to be, as mentioned, a financial impact to the employee. There is also going to be those non-economic factors such as do you have union employees? If you have union employees, then you have negotiated the benefits to be provided to your employees. How do you get out of those? Um, you know, because I cannot imagine coming to the table saying, hey, you know, we're just gonna cancel all the health benefits. You guys go ahead and hang out on the exchanges and you know, maybe we'll, we'll throw in a 50 cent, you know, 50 cent an hour ways. Yeah, it's not gonna happen. Um, so, you know, in situations where that comes, you may not be able, you know, employers may not be able to get rid of those benefits on all sectors. Um, again, one of the things I also point out is, is that, okay, you have the union on one side, you have your executives on the other, you know, who are you trying to retain on an executive basis? Have you made promises to them on what type of benefits will be provided? Um, I, I look at employment agreements all the time, and one of the, my biggest pet peeves is the part that says, we will provide you health insurance forever, <laughs> no matter why you quit. <laughs> Um, you know, but those are those are things that have to be considered and negotiated. It's not going to be just a one stop. It may not be just a one stop deal and say, oh, financial analysis. Our employees are going to be fine. Our employer, you know, we're going to save so much money. We'll bump up the salaries a thousand dollars for all of our employees, and we're good. Um, we'll pay the penalties and move on. It's not going to be that simple, and so much of it's going to just depend on your demographics. And I think that goes to the point of you know, who are you trying to retain and your retention? And those are gonna have to be discussions that aren't just made in the, you know, CFO's office, but in the benefits office and your consultant's offices and things like that. You bring up a really good point about the union element. And we are, we're non-union here at the Oldsmar in our manufacturing plant. And uh, we do have some sites across our corporation, of course, uh, that have maybe different multiple unions mm -hmm. represented. So that's a representation and a negotiated item that is going to have to be faced as well. Right. So. This presentation is made available for educational purposes only to provide you general information and a general understanding of the law. It is not intended to provide nor does it constitute legal or tax advice. The presentation should not be used as a substitute for specific legal or tax advice from a licensed professional attorney or tax consultant that you have engaged for that purpose. Further, the subject matter contained in this presentation is complex and subject to change. Any tax statements in this program are not intended to suggest the avoidance of U.S. federal, state, or local tax penalties.